everybody and welcome to the launch today of this official document, the Official Australian Reference Guide for Agricultural Biotechnolo Biotechnology and GM Crops. I'm Catherine McGrath, your MC for today. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we meet, the Ngunnawal people, and pay respects to Elders past, present and emerging. And I extend that acknowledgement to all Indigenous people with us today and all of those watching on the live stream in their offices, homes and home offices around Australia. Thank you for joining us, both online and here today at the National Press Club. We're speaking here from the National Press Club and we want to welcome everyone who is here with us for this launch. This guide has been put together by the Agricultural Biotechnology Council of Australia, and congratulations to everybody who has worked on this. We've got a great panel event today, and for the start of proceedings, I wanted to make sure all the panellists were up so we had a chance to uh, introduce them all. Agricultural biotechnology and GM crops are a key feature of agriculture today, and yet public discussion and debate remains limited. There is so much more to say and so much more society and general communities want to be involved in, and that's very much what this report is about. This reference guide aims to change that thought and that limited discussion through its detailed analysis, scientific backing, and thorough outlines for everyone to see, study, enjoy, and share. The document is about the benefits of biotechnology and GM crops across Australia. Today, as we launch this guide, we'll hear from three speakers, and I'd like to take a moment to introduce them all to you now. First of all, Ken Matthews AO. Ken is a former secretary of the Department of Agriculture and has been the chairman of the Agricultural Biotechnology Council of Australia since 2014. Good afternoon, Ken, and thanks for joining us. Dr. Caitlin Burt is a research laboratory leader at the Department of Plant Sciences within the Research School of Biology in the College of Science at the Australian National University and is a world leader on this technology. Thank you very much, Dr. Burt, for joining us today. Matthew Cozzi, CEO of CropLife Australia, and Matthew also serves on the Board of Directors of the Agricultural Biotechnology Council of Australia. Thank you very much for all the panellists for being up here for the introduction. We'll allow uh, Matthew and Caitlin to take their seats again, and we'll begin proceedings with a presentation from Mr Ken Matthews, AO. Thank you, and good afternoon. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. great to see so many of you here in person. That's something we don't take for granted these days. Uh, but to have so many people in the room is terrific. Uh, and I'd also like to welcome all the people across Australia who are watching uh, the webcast as well, um, uh, who couldn't be here today. Uh, I too acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Uh, my job today is to launch the official Australian reference guide to agricultural biotechnology and GM crops, uh, which I now gladly do. So that's over and done with. Um, but there is a copy for everyone here on the table, of course, and for people uh, who are watching this virtually, uh, there's a copy on the website or available on, on request. But I want to make clear that uh, I'm pleased to launch this guide, not just because biotechnology has so much promise, for our very challenging global future, which I'll be describing in a moment, but more importantly because this guide is such a great contribution to a more rational, science-based discussion about biotechnology-derived crops and foods. In what I think is an increasingly alarming world of fake news, alternative facts, disinformation, disdain for experts, suspicion of science, opinions trumping evidence, and blindly partisan position taking, we do need more reliable, accessible, and factual inputs to the public debate. And that's what this guide provides. And that's what the gene technology public debate sorely needs. Just as people concerned about climate change urge us to listen to the science, so too should science and evidence be front and centre in the gene technology debate because it's a debate that's been running too long and a debate, a debate that we urgently need to complete. 
The world's population is growing quickly and is expected to reach 9.7 billion by 2050. According to the UN's Food and Agriculture Organisation, food production will need to double to feed the world. Finding double the area of land for global crop production is simply not realistic. Finding double uh, the traditional inputs of agricultural chemicals and fertilisers is surely not feasible. And using double the water we use now for agriculture would be literally impossible. But it gets even more difficult than that. The necessary doubling of food production will need to be achieved in a changing world climate likely to radically disrupt traditional patterns of global agriculture. At the same time, the community will be demanding that agriculture continue to reduce its use of agricultural chemicals and artificial fertilisers or substitute more benign or naturally derived chemicals and fertiliser inputs. And community pressure to return water to the environment, to use water only to its sustainable level of extraction, will grow not only in Australia but in other countries as well. So world agriculture will need to innovate, not simply duplicate, what we're doing now. We will need to produce much more while using much less. The good news is that agricultural biotechnology is increasingly recognised as part of the necessary innovation. It offers many exciting avenues to reduce pressure on agricultural and environmental resources. It's already starting to yield drought tolerant new crop varieties, crops that can thrive in saline soils, crops that require less fertiliser, crops that resist traditional pests and diseases, crops that mature quicker and enable multiple rotations, crops that benefit the soil and soil ecosystems, crops that require fewer chemicals, crops that require less land area per tonne, crops that generate less greenhouse gas, crops that require less water, and crops that simply yield more per hectare. But as important as these production benefits are, agricultural biotechnology is also beginning to, de to deliver for consumers. It is yielding higher quality food and animal feed and longer lasting product which results in less food waste. It's producing staple food crops requiring less chemical spraying before consumption, such as the BT eggplant in South Asia where once up to 80 insecticide sprays per season were necessary but now, with the benefit of biotechnology, pesticide use has reduced by 90%. It's producing more nutritious food, especially for people with restricted diets in developing countries. For example, you may have heard of golden rice, which is now becoming available in the developing world and offers the chance of avoiding 500,000. That's 500,000 fewer blind children per year as a result of uh, biotechnology derived vitamin A embedded in otherwise conventional rice. Our own new farm here in Australia is producing omega-3 rich canola. A single hectare of that crop can replace 10 tonnes of wild caught fish. In the US, uh, a canola cooking oil with zero trans fats and reduced saturated fat has been developed. Other consumer benefits in the pipeline include high fibre wheat, iron enriched baking flour, rice wheat and vegetables with less carbs and up to 60% more protein, allergen free peanuts and, and there's much more on the way. So my personal position is clear, the world will need gene technologies if it's to feed itself. But as we do so, there'll be a great many additional benefits that we'll be gaining as well. But that's not the reason why the Agricultural Biotechnology Council of Australia, let's call it ABCA, was formed. And it's not the reason I'm here today. ABCA was formed and I'm here today because we urgently need a better quality public debate about GMOs in Australia. ABCA is not in the business of explicitly advocating for biotechnology. That's a job for others. Rather, ABCA can and does advocate for a more rational, inclusive, respectful and effective public discussion of the issues and the opportunities. Proponents of biotechnology need to participate in that discussion in a way that earns the trust and support of the community. They need members of the community to recognise for themselves the outstanding potential of these technologies. Social licence to use these technologies into the future depends on the community accepting them as a welcome solution, not just a new and unwanted problem. 
Proponents of GMOs need to stop talking combatively about winning the debate and start talking respectfully in a way that wins hearts and minds. We need to reach out to our fellow citizens and hear and respond to their concerns. We need to speak up for the many silent beneficiaries of GMOs, such as the environment, such as farmed animals, such as people in distant developing countries, and here in Australia, the disadvantaged, the sick and the poor. We need to build a community constituency of support for GMOs comprising more than just scientists and industry, which we have now. We need to nurture public confidence about safety and the quality of Australia's regulatory system. And I can tell you, I consider it to be first class. We need to be better at sharing the excitement of great science that will change the world for the better because these are technologies that will be every bit as far-reaching and as valuable as the IT revolution. We need to be more positive about them. In short, our aim, I think, should be to build wide community confidence in and positive support for gene technologies. We need to get past the current stage of this long-running debate from where we are now, which, which is the stage of what I call suspicious public tolerance, to a future of confident, public acceptance. But to have the right public debate, we need to be more thoughtful about putting the, ne the necessary facts, science and evidence on the table. And that's what today's guide is all about. The aim is to have public attitudes and decisions about agricultural biotechnology built on credible science-based information. Unfortunately, debate on these topics is too often hijacked by fear mongers. Misinformation and willful disinformation uh, have dogged the debate to date. Information based on facts is crucially important in our changing world. It's an antidote to this fake news so that people can make their own, their own sound decisions. And this is where ABCA has been making a difference. ABCA was founded in 2012 with the National Farmers Federation, Ausbiotech and CropLife as founding members. ABCA's mission is to ensure the public policy and the regulatory environment for agricultural biotechnology is guided by credible and factual information. The Council recognises that farmers do need access to the full range of innovation tools, including the transformative potential of biotechnology if they're to maximise the food and fibre production in a more sustainable way that protects our natural environment. This Reference guide provides the necessary information about genetically modified crops based on scientific evidence. The guide continues to be a popular and trusted source of information to anyone looking for factual, evidence-based answers to the questions we all have about science of genetic modification in plants. This is the fourth edition. Since the first edition, the guide has evolved to include the latest developments in agricultural biotechnology, and the fourth edition focuses in particular on the far-reaching and exciting role that gene editing will play in the future of agriculture. The guide also follows the evolution of consumer attitudes in Australia and globally and gives voice to farmers who, after all, are the experts at growing what feeds our nation. The guide is based on the expertise of our panel of internationally recognised Australian experts, led by my colleague and friend Dr TJ Higgins from the CSIRO, who's here today. TJ's knowledge and skills when it comes to biotechnology is world class, and his personal work on GM cowpeas with and for African farmers has the potential to transform the food security of over 200 million people who rely on this staple crop for their food supply. Finally, I wanted to say a few words about an Australian industry close to my heart, Australian agriculture. Too often, agriculture is seen by urban Australians as yesterday's industry, or worse, a legacy industry imposing environmental costs on a fragile Australian landscape. That's not the agriculture I know and I care about. More and more Australian farms are capital intensive, R&D driven, environmentally conscious, and technologically advanced and entrepreneurial. Many of the best farmers are younger and highly educated. Many are women. As well as running sophisticated farming operations, they accept leadership responsibilities in their own regional communities. Few urban Australians realise that our farmers produce up to 93% of the food that we eat as a nation. Because of their efforts, Australia is ranked as one of the most food secure nations in the world. 
Australia's agricultural sector is the largest employer in many rural and regional communities. It represents a significant part of our national exports, with around $50 billion of food exports each year and growing. Australian farmers are so efficient at producing food that two-thirds of the people that they feed live overseas, making our agriculture sector a serious contributor to the global food trade. For all these reasons and, and more, I believe Australians should be prouder of our farmers and their performance. Farmers have long been an important part of our heritage and Australian national identity. We need their performance to continue, but the continuing performance of farmers is critically, critically reliant on continuing innovation. For decades, productivity growth in Australian agriculture has outstripped productivity growth in the remainder of the economy. Our farmers' continuing drive to build the best science and technology into their farming practices is, of course, in their interests, but many urban Australians don't recognise that it's in the overall national interest too. As those leading edge farmers take advantage of novel technologies in areas such as computer science and statistics, robotics, chemistry, artificial intelligence, and so on, we owe them a rational science and evidence-based discussion of the most promising future technology of all, biotechnology. And the guide that we're launching today aims to do just that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Ken Matthews AO, the Chair of the Agricultural Biotechnology Council of Australia. And Ken, some great ideas to begin this discussion today, and particularly I think of great interest to this room is that call for a new debate, an engaging debate, so that people involved in the science and the business sectors of biotechnology can talk to the people of Australia, but also for opening the ears for other people to this new debate to make sure it's based on science and this booklet will certainly guide that. So thank you, Ken, for opening that discussion and much to talk about in the panel session that follows. I'd like to now welcome to the podium Dr Caitlin Burt. As we heard, Caitlin Burt is a world leader and recognised internationally for her work. Her team identified a gene in wild wheat that contributes to salinity tolerance and has gone on to improve the tolerance of modern wheat varieties here in Australia. Dr Burt believes Australia must upgrade its plant resources to be ready for the modern world, to increase yield and to deal with the environmental challenges we have before us. Dr Burt, thank you very much. Welcome to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. You are all bearing witness to the dawn of the fifth technological revolution. Welcome to the biotechnological revolution. New biotechnologies are being built every day that will improve your quality of life and help humanity to solve some of the major challenges that we are facing. So today there are three topics that we are going to cover. First, we are going to celebrate the achievements that we have made in relation to improving the approaches we use to genetically modify crops. Second, we're going to look at how we use these approaches to improve agricultural productivity. And finally, we're going to look at the goals for the future in relation to the use of these types of technology. But before we learn, launch into those three topics, let's review the evidence in relation to whether or not we are entering the biotechnological revolution. So the first industrial revolution happened around 260 years ago. We made machines and started manufacturing. In the second revolution, we gained electricity, road transport and mass production. The third was the digital revolution and we gained automation and computing. And the fourth gave us, hey Google, it gave us big data and advanced robotics. And now we are revolutionising living things. But suggesting that the biotechnological revolution starts now does not give fair credit to the enormous amount of work of our ancestors 
who have been altering crop genomes for thousands of years. So when we go to the supermarket, all of the fruits and the vegetables and the grains that we pick up, the genomes that encode for those products were developed by our ancestors. So what's different now? What is different between the approaches that we take now for modifying crop genomes and the approaches that our ancestors have taken for thousands of years to modify crop genomes? So historically, we have used selective breeding as a main method to modify crop genomes. And now we have precise tools for genome editing. So selective breeding involved choosing plants with desirable traits and mating them. And this combines and replicates the desired traits in the offspring and repeated over many generations. This results in significant genetic gains in domesticated crops relative to the ancestral species that they were derived from. But when we make these changes, historically, we haven't actually known at a molecular level what has changed. We haven't known which genes have changed. So the first time that humanity changed an organism and knew exactly which genes we had changed dates back to 1973. So researchers uh, identified a gene in bacteria that encodes for an antibiotic resistance and they were able to transfer that gene from one bacteria that naturally contains it to another one that didn't have it and successfully transferred that resistance mechanism. Now last year, humankind for the first time ever synthesized an entire genome. They put together four million base pairs of genetic code which enables the coding of the basic functions that are required for life. So they put those four million base pairs into a simple cell and that enabled the encoding of life functions that enabled that cell to live, which is quite revolutionary. So what this means is that our innovators have the precision tools to be able to write and revise genetic code. We can create and edit with precision to deliver desirable biological functions. So this is a little similar to writing and revising computer code to create desirable computational functions. Now the first computer code was written back in 1842 by Ada Lovelace. So Ada came up with a sequence of numbers on punch cards that programmed the first analytical engine, which then subsequently led to the development of computers and the development of the computational power that we have today. This year, the entire world eagerly awaits the biological programming of a vaccine to address the problem of the COVID-19 pandemic. So the advance that we are celebrating today is that when we come up against major problems like COVID-19 and like crop disease resistance, we have the precision tools to be able to design solutions to those problems. So this type of technology is particularly valuable for advancing agriculture. And we're going to look at corn as an example. So if you have a look at these pictures, you can see the wild ancestor of corn, Tio Sinte, which is a Mexican grass. And it has a dozen small uh, kernels. We applied 9,000 years of genome modification, of selecting of this, this grass to create the modern, juicy, high-yielding corn that we all enjoy today. Now, it turns out that there are actually five key genes, five key changes that encode for the key differences between the sort of wild, runty teosinte and the delicious, juicy, modern corn that we enjoy today, but it took thousands of years for us to get those five genes in the right order, in the right genetic background, for us to be able to create the corn that we enjoy. Now, last year, researchers identified one gene in our modern corn, a natural gene that's already there, um, which usually turns on around flowering time in corn, and they were able to reprogram that to turn on a little bit earlier in the crop development, which led to a 10% gain in corn yield. 
It's possible that if we look for related genes in other crop species and have a look at the timing of which they're expressed and bring them to be expressed on earlier, we might be able to gain greater crop yields for, for other crops as well. So all of our crops came from wild plant species and we have spent thousands of years modifying those genomes to gain the favourite foods that we enjoy today. But humanity is not the only cause of changes in plant genomes. So wild plants that we have never domesticated, their genomes change over time as well. Genomes can change by interactions with natural soil bacteria, by solar radiation. Built into genomes are natural mechanisms that cause change over time, such as transposable elements. And of course, each generation you have changes through genetic recombination. So you can expect between 0.1 to 100 mutations per genome per generation naturally. So the difference is that we now have the technology to know exactly what base pairs have changed and exactly what effect that base pair change has. Using these, the biotechnology, uh, biotechnological tools that are available to us, we've worked out what genome changes give us the best outcomes and learned how to engineer those changes to give us desirable outcomes. And with that sort of technology, we've been able to enhance food crop nutrition. So for example, the uh, golden rice with enhanced vitamin A to help prevent blindness and save lives in impoverished regions. We've improved crop disease resistance which then has brought enormous environmental benefits from reduced pesticide use. We've been able to create sustainable, healthier food and oil production, and we've been able to create renewable, environmentally friendly, raw resources for, for humanity. We've been able to increase crop grain yields and improve profitability for growers using this technology. So we've just come out of facing one of Australia's worst droughts. And in the future, we, there's no escaping additional extreme weather events. We don't have thousands of years to selectively breed for the type of environments that we're going to experience in the next decade. But we do have precision, cutting edge tools to be able to engineer the crops that we need for future climates and for future productivity. So, Developing investment into agricultural biotechnology is a pathway to future productivity and to economic gains. I've had the um, benefit of being able to involve, be involved with research teams working on improving crop salinity tolerance. We were able to transfer a gene into modern germ wheat, which then subsequently led to greater grain yields on saline soils. And with my colleagues at ANU and colleagues at CSIRO and partner institutions, we are working on Im further improving both salinity tolerance and drought tolerance in crops. My colleagues have already identified mechanisms that we can use to significantly increase the water use efficiency of crops, and these are in pathways through to developing these varieties for, for farmers. It's critical that we use the best technology that is available to create the best resources for our growers and to be able to create resources for new growing environments, such as protected agriculture. So to give an example of the economic benefits, last year a report uh, was published which was an independent economic analysis of the return on investment for uh, funding into the National Institute of Agricultural Botany in the UK. So this gives us an example of how benefits like this can pay off. For each one pound that was invested in this type of research, there was around a 19 pound gain, a 19 pound return on investment across the different crops that they have worked on. So this means that this type of investment for Australia is a pathway to prosperity. It's a pathway to creating a profitable and sustainable, resilient future for our agricultural industries and for the next generations of Australians. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Caitlin Bird, and a very detailed uh, timeline there.
Caitlin, thank you very much, talking about uh, the timeline of genetic modification that has landed with these precision tools today. So thank you very much for that uh, great outline. It is now time to hear from CropLife. The CEO of CropLife is Matthew Cozzi. Uh, Matthew is the CEO of CropLife and also a member of the Board of Directors of the Agricultural Biotechnology Council of Australia. Matthew, thank you. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Kath. It's been half a century uh, since world-renowned agronomist and plant breeder Norman Borlaug was awarded the Nobel Prize for his contribution to global food security. And since that time, science-based research and development, which uh, Dr Bird has just so excellently outlined, and the innovations that have come from it have enabled farming to continue that green revolution that Dr Borlaug started. Agriculture is moving beyond just improving food security and is in fact underpinning our ability globally to achieve UN sustainable development goals. A new generation of farmers, of environmentalists, of policymakers will help shape how agriculture will intersect with not just climate change, biodiversity and livelihoods, but also social rights, including how agriculture can improve equity in the developing world. As the National Peak Industry Organisation for the plant science uh, sector in Australia, CropLife uh, represents the developers of agricultural biotechnology innovations that are key to the nation's cropping productivity, profitability and sustainability. We are proud to be one of the founding members of the Agricultural Biotechnology Council of Australia as we seek, with others, to ensure factual, science-based information about biotech innovations is available to political leaders, to policy makers, the media and the community more broadly. Now, more than ever, farmers need all agricultural innovations, including those from crop biotechnology, to feed, uh, the, uh, to, to feed that ever-growing population that, uh, that Ken Matthews mentioned earlier. And farmers are being challenged like never before to deliver high yields with less resources, produce more nutritious foods and improve existing agricultural methods and practices. All this while facing unprecedented droughts, floods and bushfires, not to mention a global pandemic. Not only is our agriculture sector facing unprecedented challenges, it is also under attack. At a time where there is peak interest in food, with so many people turning on to MasterChef or My Kitchen Rules or the latest TV cooking competition show, we also seem to have reached a peak ignorance in our predominantly urban-based populations on how food is produced and on farming generally. Consumers are plagued with misinformation at every corner. Science, unfortunately, does not always win public policy debates in the short or even medium term, irrespective of the quantity or depth of the conclusive evidence available. Australia's biotechnology regulatory system is considered one of the world's best, which Ken also referenced earlier. We are very fortunate to have an internationally respected technically proficient, transparent and independent gene technology regulator. But our system still needs to evolve to support innovation and to give farmers access to all the tools they need to produce our food, feed and fibre. Otherwise, Australia will fall behind and will miss out on the crucial developments in this next revolution that Dr Burt just referenced. Food in the developed world is safer now than at any time in human history. And yet consumers are still led, easily led astray by activists with narrow and self-serving agendas. This, in turn, poses the risk of politicians responding to that ignorance, to the detriment not just of farming, but to the community at large, because, as we know, we all have to eat. GM crops are the most tested and regulated food product in human history. Thousands of hours of R&D and independent scientific assessment go into ensuring that any GM crop approved for cultivation, commercially or otherwise, is as safe, if not safer, 
for human health and the environment as its conventional counterpart. Since GM crop cultivation started in 1996, more than 183 million hectares of land has been saved from ploughing and cultivation, leading to improved water storage, limited soil erosion and increased availability of land for other environmental issues, as well as significantly reducing the use of pesticides to ensure the viability and sustainability of that important modern chemistry. The cultivation of GM crops worldwide in 2018 led to a reduction in CO2 emissions of over 27 million tonnes, or if you like, it's the equivalent of removing 86% of all registered vehicles in Australia for the entire year. Even with such a stellar track record, anti-GM and anti-modern modern farming campaigners who supposedly consider themselves environmentalists are still protesting the right for farmers to use the technology. If nothing, it, it really is nothing short of mind-blowing that people who claim to care about the environment would oppose a technology that improves environmental sustainability and limits greenhouse gas emissions from farming. We have, as an industry, as an R&D sector and as a science, been hamstrung by community ignorance around biotechnology, which has allowed for a discourse of fear, misinformation and scare tactics by organisations that, quite frankly, I think are the 21st century equivalent of the Flat Earth Society. We've seen this very recently in state-based discussions about GM crop moratoria, as well as the way that scientific advancements such as gene editing are portrayed by opponents in the media. At this very moment, we have a few local councils in South Australia behaving like troglodytes and luddites in this staggeringly ignorant manner by which they are trying to deny access to GM crop cultivation for their own farmers. Of course, in politics, perception is the reality. The challenge here is how do we ensure that we reinforce with the Australian community that the nation's farmers are world's best practice growers and producers. And to remain so, they need to have access to new safe ag innovations, such as GM and gene edited crops. It is the responsibility and indeed obligation of all of us in the sector to fill this gap between the science and the public discourse, and most importantly, between the science and the public policy. As experts and stakeholders for the agriculture sector, the onus is on us to better facilitate the communication between consumers and producers, as well as credibly separate myth from fact. We need to help consumers and the community more broadly make their own choices based on facts and not fear or on outdated, romanticised visions of agriculture. It is why the Australian Bio Biotechnology Council of Australia, its expert panel, led by Dr TJ Higgins, and its specialist advisors, such as Dr Anne-Sophie Delen, should be congratulated and commended for this latest and updated edition of the Official Reference Guide for Ag Biotech and GM Crops. Crop biotechnology innovations are crucial agricultural tools for global food production and will only be more important in the coming decades. Farmers need to have access to them, along with the suite of other modern farming tools and practices, if they are going to be able to continue to produce food, feed and fibre in a sustainable, affordable and productive manner. For science to prevail, the world needs to be informed regarding the real challenges we face to feed a growing global population and the solutions available for meeting that challenge. Unfortunately, many of our modern urban-based populations prefer to be guided on these issues by the latest guru fraudster TV celebrity chef rather than the collective knowledge and wisdom of thousands of scientists and decades of robust scientific data. It is somewhat ironic that at a time when consumers are demanding more ethical and environmentally sustainable farming practices, many reject innovations such as GM and gene edited crops that deliver just that. Some city dwelling urbanites have become so smart on issues of farming, they are at risk of sending us all back to the dark ages. However, it is also important to keep such matters in perspective 
because of the work of the sector and the organisations like ABCA over recent years, I firmly believe that the growing majority of Australians recognise and accept the safety and importance and benefit of these innovations and their use by farmers. A little bit like the vaccine debate. The extreme nutcase anti-vaxxers are only a very small group, albeit a noisy group, who clearly spend all of their time on social media platforms as opposed to actually reading any credible scientific material on the subject, but they seem to get a disproportionate amount of media. I think comparisons with the anti-GM movement can certainly be made, but we should remember, and more importantly, politicians need to realise that these groups do not reflect the vast majority of the community, either in Australia or around the world. Clearly, this is a very challenging and dynamic area, but also an exciting and a rewarding one. Thankfully, we have talented scientists and science communicators like Dr. Caitlin Burt, committed uh, people such as Ken Matthews, who are all doing great work to assist in this space. Their voices need to be heard their expertise recognised if we want to achieve our goals to feed the world in a more sustainable, viable way. It is time to tackle the false ideologies and the food fanaticisms that have no foundation in fact or science, and the ABCA guide certainly contributes to that. Despite all the challenges, Australian agriculture is a world-leading industry and has the potential to only grow stronger. And I commend ABCA for its work in supporting this effort. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew Cozzi, CEO of Crop Life Australia. In a very strong presentation, Matthew, with some strong comments there about the need for the debate to change. Well, we've got a lot to talk about in the panel. We'll get our panellists to take their seats and we'll be going until half past one. Thank you very much. So we're going to start off with you, Ken Matthews. Now, everyone made very strong presentations today. Ken, you also were very strong in your view that a new debate needs to happen. What is the greatest challenge you face in trying to convince stakeholders of the benefits of this technology? Well, Catherine, as, uh, as I was arguing, I, I think we've got to try to move the debate from uh, what I describe as grudging, suspicious uh, tolerance through to enthusiastic uh, support and confidence. And to do that, we, we need to engage real people. Uh, and that means uh, families, friends, uh, social media. Uh, it means uh, being able to uh, uh, resource material such as we're releasing today as the foundation for the discussions that, that we need to have. Um, and it, it means, I think, uh, conducting our, ourselves differently in the debate. I, I think uh, so far the constituency we have has been preaching to itself uh, and the constituency that we have has, has been very narrow. It's been big companies, uh, most farmers uh, and scientists, uh, but where are the people? Where are the people? So I think uh, we need to be listening to the people, not grumbling about uh, science illiteracy, uh, but listening and responding and answering the, their questions, which are every bit as valid as anyone else's. So I, I think it, it requires a change in the debate, the way we conduct ourselves in the debate. Let's think about us, not about them. And do you have a time frame for this redesigned debate to take place? And well, is it affected? Is it, is it launched in some way by this today? Um, look, I, I'm an optimist in mm. everything. Uh, so I, I, think, I think we're a reasonable way through the debate now. As I said, I, I think there is uh, at least community tolerance now uh, for GMOs, but um, we, we need to get to that, that stage of enthusiastic support because of all the opportunities. I mean, and Caitlin's uh, presentation was quite inspiring about the opportunities that uh, are being not taken advantage of at the moment. So we can build that sort of optimism in. And, and one thing I should have mentioned is um, I think we should be making more of the quality of our regulatory scheme in Australia. 
I mean, and not to embarrass uh, uh, our gene technology re regulator who is in the audience today, but we have one of the best gene technology regulation schemes in the world. People visit Australia to learn about it, to see if we can adopt, if they can adopt uh, some of the things Australia does uh, in their own countries. Um, and it works on the basis of science, uh, consultation. Um, it's very transparent. People uh, can, uh, uh, there, there is a source of advice on ethics and uh, public concerns. Uh, and it's responsible in a single national system rather than state by state, which could have been worse, um, to, uh, to look at the, the health and environmental safety and to identify the risks and to uh, manage any of those risks uh, in, a, uh, in a rational way. So I think we've got a great story to tell, uh, but it's not well understood by many Australians and we need to tell that story more okay, effectively. Thanks very much. Caitlin Burt, you talk about this regularly, but how often do you make such an impassioned plea talking about the history of gene technology and, and who do you have to convince now? What are the challenges for you as you speak to other scientists and the community about this? Well, that's a, that's a great question. So in March last year, I had the opportunity to be part of a Tasting Australia event, which was an audience full of uh, general public from all walks of life. And they wanted to know, they wanted to understand what, what is the difference between what we've always done, what we're doing now. It's very natural, I think, for a person to want to feel confident that what they're eating is what they think they're eating because, you know, food becomes us. We're made out of our food and we want to be confident about that. Everyone should be able to go into a supermarket and have confidence that what they're um, purchasing is good for them. It's healthy. It's good for the planet. It's good for their families. And I think it's really important that, you know, as a, a group of experts that we have the opportunity to do things like engage with programs in schools and engage with public events. Because each of the people who are developing the technologies for the tomorrow, they're people too. They have families. They go to the supermarket and they also want confidence in, um, in the products that are available to, to them and, and a continuity of the amazing food resources that we've enjoyed in Australia for so long. We all want to see that go forward. It's just understanding that we have superb different technologies to enable that productivity to continue in the future. Caitlin, thanks for that. Uh, Matthew, you put out a very strong challenge today in terms of where you think the debate should go. And I'm going to ask you about that. But first of all, could you bring us in general up to date, those in the room and those watching on the live stream, where are we at at Australia right now in terms of the situation in South Australia and across the country with GM acceptance? Well, in some ways, I think uh, that leads us to have some optimism that, in fact, science is prevailing in the debate. Um, South Australian uh, is the last mainland state to remove their moratorium and that'll take effect um, uh, as of next month. Uh, there, are some, uh, there is the option for local councils in South Australia at the moment to uh, seek to remain GM uh, uh, free if they wish to and can make a case that there is some nominal marketing or, or trade benefit. Um, we know from the example around the rest of Australia and the rest of the world, there is none. Um, and so really, uh, we are seeing common sense and good public policy prevail in this space. Um, uh, but it's probably a couple of decades later than what it needed to be. Uh, and I think that's the issue. Is, 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 so I think worldwide we're about to become a reasonably good leader. We've seen um, the uh, a range of modernisations of the regulatory arrangement, arrangements that the OGTR manages uh, to see us match with our, uh, our uh, equivalent um, agricultural competitive countries around the world. Um, so we're seeing um, regulation remain modern. We see the system under review at the moment. We'll see hopefully another shift to recognise uh, where the technology is at and its, its safety. And I think on Caitlin's point too, anyone who has any understanding of the thousands of years of plant breeding that went before uh, 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 gene technology or agricultural bio biotechnology um, has no concern with agricultural biotechnology whatsoever. Uh, it is really just the next natural step in, a, in developing the, the tools that we've had. So in some ways, very good. I think we've seen progress and, we, and I think we see farmers getting access to it and the fact that uh, we're about to see the end of any GM moratorium on mainland Australia is good. Tasmania still remains a bit of a case down there, but um, they'll catch up eventually, no doubt. 
And you, you spoke in your presentation about an end to what you called food fanaticism, and you likened the anti-vaxxers to the anti-GM debate. Can you expand on that a little bit? And where do you see the main challenge in the people you need to convince if you want this technology to be taken up more widely? Mm. Well, I think they sell it as a joint membership, anti-vaxxer, anti-GM. Um, there seems to be a high correlation between both groups. Um, I think it's important that, as I mentioned, that we don't get distracted in public debates by very small extremist groups that can make a lot of noise. Um, um, and, uh, and the vast majority of Australians walk into their supermarkets or local grocery store foods or their farmers markets with full confidence just by the mere fact of their purchasing um, uh, a profile that the food that farmers are producing is safe and good for them and they go about their business. That's 98, 99% of, of people every day. So by mere actions of how we live our lives, uh, there's an endorsement of confidence in the system. Uh, but improving that um, is important. Farmers having access to new innovations to be able to become uh, more sustainable is crucial. And the population having a better understanding of what's required to achieve that is crucial. We all have an obligation, as I said, but I think it's gone beyond that. I think the disconnect we have now between modern society and their understanding of food production is so significant and it is, in fact poses a threat uh, to humanity going forward that it's time for government to serious have, seriously have a look at right at the early stages of, education, of the education system to be informing people about the reality of the system. So the decisions they made are made on facts on a common sense understanding of how farming and agriculture works and will make them a little more resistant to false extreme positions. I think we are at that point. The natural connections that our urban populations used to have with farming Australia, I mean, we even had a term for it, country cousins, where you know, there'd always be some connection to the land um, in decades gone past. That's gone now. And that needs to be replaced in some formal sense, I think, in the education system. Thank you for that. Well, looking back at the science, um, Caitlin, your area is in plant membranes right now. What is that offering at the moment to plant technology and what are the things that you think can be delivered in this area to farmers and then eventually to food production? Uh, that's a good question. So from working previously in relation to improving salt tolerance, in lots of that work, what we did is we studied natural populations to figure out, okay, if there's a plant that can grow really, really well in our target environment, so uh, really saline soils, how does it do it? What do we learn from that? And then how can we take a crop that we want, so our modern varieties, and um, engineer it such that it can tolerate that environment as well? And in lots of cases in relation to uh, studying membrane proteins, it, there are, uh, is a huge variety of uh, different types of mechanisms in a huge variety of different crops. And it's just about learning what works well in different environments and then being able to introduce that into different environments. Thanks very much for that. Uh, Ken, this is the fourth edition of this booklet, of uh, this guide. What's changed this time? Uh, this, this time there's more emphasis on, I, I think, the game-changing opportunities associated with gene editing. Uh, there's more emphasis on the, uh, the community debate and uh, community attitudes and uh, how best to handle that. So we're, we're saying less sort of single-mindedly, here are the facts, uh, surely you can understand that. Uh, rather, I, I think we're trying to be more open to uh, people's starting points and uh, and uh, contributing to that debate in a, in a more sensitive and thoughtful way than we, than we might have in previous editions. And how do you see it being used? Well, we, we want it to be a foundation. I mean, this, this whole debate uh, is about let, let's try to get those opportunities of, uh, uh, of biotechnology for solving problems. We're all problem solvers, effective, effective people everywhere are problem solvers, and there are problems, world environmental problems, world food shortages, uh, all sorts of problems that can be solved by, uh, by these technologies. We want to be this, as a, a, that booklet, to be a foundation for the debate that tries to yield those opportunities, yield those um, uh, solutions to the problems um, by making it a, a debate that 
is more constructive and better founded than it has been in the past. Thanks for that. Matthew Fuzzy, who is on this journey with you, with CropLife, with the Agricultural Biotechnology Council of Australia? Well, the discussion the about uh, eight years ago uh, uh, when I uh, uh, joined the sector um, uh, be, and, uh, and looked at the that sort of the, the strategic environment in which this debate was happening uh, showed that for those of us who are probably a little more in the advocacy field, in the, in the industry organisation field, um, had a greater challenge if we didn't have a base understanding amongst public policy um, uh, and, 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 and political leadership. Uh, and, uh, and so it was uh, with uh, the National Farmers Federation, uh, with uh, Ausbiotech, uh, uh, ourselves, uh, that came together to say there needs to be a body uh, that at least uh, brings together Australia's and world leading experts uh, provides the information so that at least then the debate can start from a factual basis. And I think that's the issue. It's not that um, ag biotechnology is the silver bullet to fix every problem in farming. Uh, uh, it is uh, simply one tool and it's about that broader debate in agriculture saying here are all the options, here are all the safe innovations. Uh, how a farmer wishes to farm shouldn't be a political or ideological issue. It should be one based in science for best environmental sustainability and production and let them have the gamut of solutions available as we go through the massive challenges uh, that Dr Bird outlined earlier that they are facing over the coming decades. Uh, and so I think there's, uh, with National Farmers Federation, Oz Biotech ourselves and a raft of other agricultural leading organisations have come together to continue to support this effort um, because we think that we'll see a better debate more broadly and better public, public policy outcomes longer term. Thanks, you, Matthew. And I'm sure people here and those watching live should be keen to know, where does the politics sit right now as the challenge for you? Oh, well, I think at least federally and now, in fact, essentially in every state, we have a bipartisan position. Um, again, you know, science eventually prevails, thankfully. Um, uh, but again, we need to have a more engaged community um, so that as we need the public policy and regulatory settings to adapt and modernise and allow access to these innovations, that that comes with community support and the community understands uh, that that's to their benefit. So if I'm right then, Ken, is it, you're saying that the, the science is right, the scientific community is on board, the industry is on board, the politics essentially is bipartisan, so that's sorted. The big mystery in the middle is the Australian community. Exactly, exactly. And that's what we need to be tackling. Uh, this, this, public, this guide is about trying to improve the quality of the public debate, have it based, as Matthew's been saying, more on science, but uh, we, we need to have people buy in uh, buy in because there are such opportunities and uh, so much to be won uh, by, by adopting these bio, biotechnologies. Um, it's, it's fantastic and it surprises me that, that the community hasn't been more enthusiastic. So that's not their problem, that's our problem. We need to be communicating those uh, opportunities and benefits much better than we have been. So as we close this discussion today, just a final comment from each panel member. What would be your message to those sitting on the fence right now who are saying, no, I just don't like the sound of that, or that's not something I support, or I'm not interested? So starting with Ken and just moving down the panel. Ken, what's your thought to them today? Well, I, I would say, please consider. Please consider the science, of course, in the same way that we ask people to consider the science when we're talking about climate change. Um, I'd also say, please consider the uh, the opportunities in the way of solving problems that we've been talking about. There are environmental benefits that we've hardly talked about today. Um, I, I think in the future, just as a, a very quick comment, the, these technologies will offer big challenges to clean, green uh, policy makers because uh, they will give opportunities that just don't exist to improve the environment, to clean up the environment, uh, to maintain quality of the environment. So those environmental benefits, we just haven't made enough of yet either. Yeah, thank you. Well, I think being in the university environment, one of the things that inspires me uh, enormously for the future is we've got so many young students coming in, excited about learning the technology, super bright, brilliant ideas. They want to see a better future. They are brilliant enough to create a better future, and we need to not hand, handcuff them. We need to say, go for it. It is your future. 
build what you want to build, create a sustainable planet, rebuild our economy, create a better earth. Here are the tools you need. Go for it. The scientific method and science itself brought humanity out of the dark ages. Uh, I say let it just continue to benefit humanity. Uh, go, go with... Uh, go with uh, Dr Burt and her colleagues, not extreme fanatics, uh, uh, because uh, uh, letting science continue to contribute to humanity is only going to deliver better outcomes. Thank you very much. Well, just in closing, this is the document. It's available here today and also on the website. So for those who want to access the website, it is www.abca.com.au. We please thank our panellists, Ken Matthews AO, Dr Caitlin Burt, from the ANU and Matthew Cozzi, CEO of CropLife. Thank you very much. And thank